Yes. So we're going to welcome to the show, Dr. Hanley Wong. It's great to have you here. Thank you. And uh, tell, tell people a little bit about, first of all, who you are, kind of what your role is with the Academy. Uh, I'm Dr. Hanley Wong. I'm actually a professor and director of a graduate periodontics at University of Michigan. I'm currently a vice president of the Academy of Osseo Integration. We're, we're, we love research and we love um, to kind of be, to kind of geek out about research. And we know you are going to be talking about or have been talking about periimplantitis a lot. And uh, we have really, we've missed these meetings because we don't get the chance to have these types of discussions. But, you know, periimplantitis seems like it's a topic that it's a never ending story, right? It has been an evolutionary story over many, many years. And all of the theories behind why it occurs and treatment protocols has been, there's been lots of, lots of discussion. And in the last maybe six months to a year, it's become even maybe more controversial. We've heard discussions, uh, maybe that the whole problem is just a rough surface implant, right? So uh, talk a little bit about current thoughts uh, on periimplantitis, maybe just to where, you're, where your mind is with this topic these days. Yeah, it's a very interesting. This is the topic I have a deal in heart, and I, I like the periimplantitis. Actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, I was actually ranked the top one in the whole world in dealing with this topic. But the periimplantitis per se, it usually happens around about two to three implants out of 10. Mm. So it's about 20 to 30%. Mm. If you place two or three implants, uh, 10 implants a month, usually at down the road, your two or three will have a periimplantitis. And then you starting to accumulate it. That's a lot. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of uh, different uh, etio etiological factors may cause the periimplantitis. And most of the common acceptable is the bacteria we call biological concept, mm -hmm. which is a bacterial trigger. But they also have one of the things we call the uh, predisposing factors. Mm. It's what may lead toward to developing the periimplantitis, such as the one you just talked about, the rough surface. And actually, it's not the implant rough surface. It's the respect of the, we call the supracrestal fiber mm. uh, adhesion, mm -hmm. so-called the biological width. If you put the, the rough surface implant in the bone, without consider that biological width about three millimeter, mm -hmm. it's very easy. When you put a crown right down there, the body will create that space. Yes. And then the rough surface will expose. So we'll accumulate a lot of bacteria, then cause the future periimplantitis if you don't maintain it. Mm -hmm. That's why you today we talk about hybrid implant yes. type, so mm -hmm. forth, with yes. the polished color there. That's right. So it's a cushion. But so do it, you think if you place the implant with regard to soft tissue thickness, such as what Tomas Nikovicius has mm -hmm. talked a lot about mm -hmm. others, that we don't have to worry about having a polished color? Or do you think that we should be looking that direction any way we go? It's a good question. It, it's actually not the soft tissue thickness or vertical thickness. Mm. It's we call the supracrestal tissue adhesion. Mm. Mm. The, so the vertical tissue height is one of the components, mm. but the, the margin is from the finish line to the crestal bone. And that's the soft tissue space you have to respect. So, for example, if I'm going to do a rough surface implant, if I place deeper below the bone by about two millimeter, and then I put a one millimeter abutment, up, which is a three millimeter apartment. So it's one millimeter both. Yes. So then I have three millimeter. Then I have a three millimeter space. So I have a soft tissue. So mm. that rough surface implant is okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. That means you respect that the biological dimension. Yes. So that's one thing people uh, usually need to be understanding this. And till today, we have a more understanding on this concept than what we know about five, 10 years ago. Mm. And certainly there are other factors such as malposition, the titanium mm. particles, right. residual cement. There are many, many, including the restorative design. Mm. So case selection, you know, before we even place dental implants, one of the things the American Academy of Periodontology did several years back is they staged and graded periodontal disease uh, with respect to teeth. And one of the things that they left in there is they started they started uh, grading these cases, whether this was likely to pr uh, progress or really grade three or grade C is mm -hmm. like it's high chance that this is going to progress unless something changes systemically. They also left some ways in there to quantify grading. And one of those things that they did was they started talking about C-reactive proteins. Mm -hmm. And I know they've left 
other areas that have yet to be published or have are starting to be published about things we can do to assess periodontal risk mm-hmm. for future uh, cases. For instance, I'll use a case that's very near and dear to my heart is a patient that has, let's call it from an old term standpoint, refractory periodontitis, but with this would be graded like C mm-hmm. now is that that grade C patient, we remove all their teeth in stage dentition. Well, we think we solved the periodontal problem by taking out the teeth. And then this case goes and we put six to implants per arch in and we go one year at tracking bone levels. Good. And these implants placed subcrestally with transmucosal abutments and all those. Two years, three years, four years, and then five years hits, something changed. Mm. And then we have either a rejection of the implant or a recurrence of periodontal periimplantitis not periodontal disease could there been something in mm-hmm. to check and qualify or quantify our patients predicted response and prognosis yeah. going i mean forward? is this il1 polymorphism <laughs> is this c reactive protein i mean how how much do we know about these you know maybe pro inflammatory factors that could be contributing to these issues you know it, it's a Wonderful questions and put it in that way. And the way of academy of a perio to looking into the, the the grading of the disease progression. Mm-hmm. And usually we're using the smoking and diabetics plus C reactive protein and other known uh, systemic risk factors. Right. And I believe in the implant we should also adopt the same concept, mm-hmm. but maybe a different criteria. Right. So certainly smoking has been looked at, the uh, diabetics has been looked at. We didn't examine the C-reactive protein, but interleukin-1 mm-hmm. uh, can be a risk genetically, mm-hmm. and certainly other factors may play a role also mm-hmm. in this area. Yeah. So I think this is the developing area for people to get involved and to figure out, maybe I'm more prone to have a perimplantitis. Mm-hmm. Maybe I shouldn't place the implant, or maybe I should have more rigid the mm-hmm. maintenance protocol because I'm more vulnerable. Well, we just heard that uh, Dr. Gluckman said, I will not restore an, or have an implant that I placed restored with a with cement. Right. He, he said it's not screw, screw retained only. Right. And so, and, and you know why he's saying that is because there's been con- evidence published after evidence that cement remnants are there and they could cause a reaction mm-hmm. in our periodontal patients more than likely. But, but what I guess I'm, I'm wondering based on that is, you know, what can we, from a standpoint of what should we be focused on the most? Uh, and I know that's a, there's probably 10 things, but <laughs> when we talk about, you know, obviously these systemic factors right now, it seems like it's harder to quantify um, who is at the highest risk. Maybe we have some ideas from an implant design or a restorative design or a surgical principles protocol. What, what are the things you focus on the most? With clinicians, if you wanted to change, is it changing the implant you use? Is it changing the surgical protocol? Is it the restorative? What are some of the things you think are the primary factors that we should be focused on to try to reduce the risk for periimplantitis? I think the good training through what the AO was trying to do also, the good training, good understanding of biology. Hmm. So they have to understand the implant is not just place the implant. The body has reacts to it. Right. Just to take the question you just answered, saying, try give up all the uh, cement retain? My answer is no. Mm. That's that's the extreme, which is not the right way to do. But you say, what condition I can do a cement retain or screw retain? So right. let me answer that question. If I place my implant just below the gum line about one millimeter, I can get access to clean out the residual cement. Then that's perfect. Mm-hmm. And, and it's aesthetically fine. So if I place more than two millimeter, like the, all the research show, mm-hmm. we have a difficulty to remove that. Mm-hmm. Then maybe screw retain. Mm-hmm. But we also develop a different way of uh, to prevent the, the residual cement. You can create a two uh, uh, abutment, and then you can se- select in the outside abutment to take the cement out and mm-hmm. then put it on the oral cavity. Yeah. Indirect, yeah. Indirect, Indirect eye. Indirect eye. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there are many ways. So you cannot do one thing. And same way, if you have a good training, when your implant was put in the ideal position, mm. acolinguary, mesial distally, epico- the epical coronary, then it's easy to make a restoration with a prop- proper, proper angulation contour. Mm-hmm. contour, so it's easy to get access to clean. Mm. That's right. So it's, again, as a training and a good learning yeah. about biology. What do you think about some of the more maybe outside ideas, such as you mentioned, titanium particles? Mm. Uh, what about the acceptance versus rejection that Albrechtson, for instance, talks about, you know, do you think Great that question. how much of those factors do you think uh, are playing a role with these? 
You know, 14 body concept by Dr. Alpson to talk about it, it's one of a theory, but mm-hmm. never been approved yet. Yes. I think there are a lot of theory out there. People talk about periimplantitis. I'm saying, you know, we published several papers on titanium particles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we found out if you did res- have a residual titanium particle, it does trigger the foreign body reaction. It, that's true. Mm-hmm. But what amount will trigger that significant amount of the foreign body reaction caused the periimplant bonus remains unknown. Mm-hmm. So it, it, we cannot t- take one thing and jump because we've been placed implant more than what we know. But mm-hmm. We don't see a problem widespread. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I think that theory, it's maybe applied to a small population or yeah. small uh, percentage of the implants. Mm-hmm. But I don't think you can generalize it. Mm-hmm. It's just not in the research data. Shows that. What about treatment of periimplantitis? Mm-hmm. That's yes. another huge Pandora's can box. Can we treat we periimplantitis? Open. But you know, what are your thoughts on that <laughs> as far as what we have available today and what, what's, what's working and what's not? It's a great question. Now, you know, I published about seven or eight decision trees over the years and adjusted and modified it. In order for us to regenerate uh, of your uh, periimplantitis defect, I usually look into the percent of bone loss. Mm-hmm. So if I have more than 50% of bone loss, then I look into what is more predictable for me to treat this defect. Mm. And if I want to treat in the regeneration, then I have to submerge because any outside mm-hmm. and exposure will create a problem. <laughs> so deconstruct the restoration yeah. and then go right back down the platform. Yeah, mm-hmm. the same way like we place the implant so you mm-hmm. can grow bone. That's right. And we publish several papers on it. Mm-hmm. Now, if I have less than 20% of bone loss, mm-hmm. That's a minimal amount of bone loss, maybe one or two thread exposed. Maybe I do a non-surgical, maybe I do a soft tissue conditioning, mm-hmm. increase zone of a curtainite gingiva and or the thickness. So make a patient can clean and easy to get access and m- modify the contour of the restoration. Mm-hmm. But if I have a 20 to 50%, then maybe I need to look into other things. I look into soft tissue conditions. I look into defect morphologies, mm. then decide should I do a, a osseous approach and or I do a regenerative or I do a combination. Mm-hmm. So that, it, it then becomes a different criteria we select. So yes. it's not straightforward. Yeah, and that, that I think is a, is a great way to, to kind of put this. It's not straightforward. And kind of circling back to where we started this conversation, that's where things like this credentialing program are so important. Because periimplantitis can feel like the Wild West a little bit. <laughs> it can feel that way because there's so many theories, but there is data. We have data and we need to be standardizing that under. And it sounds like that, again, back to what we started this conversation with. We're, we're having people like you who are involved with credentialing that I'm sure are kind of putting your stamp on the periimplantitis side of the curriculum, yeah. you know, and then you've got the, the top minds in surgical placement that are putting their stamp on that and all the right data is being presented. And, and I, for one, am, I, I'm, we're ready for that. You know, we just talked to Dr. Agalu, we'll close with this, about sort of what's happened with the social media generation with uh, thinking things are easy mm. and they're not. they're not. And, and AO is, has never been about being easy. It's been about what works and what's proven. And in order to do that, we've got to standardize. So I, I think it's exciting to see what the organization's doing uh, to really get that information standardized where when you see someone's a diplomat or a fellow, you know that that really means something. And that, right. so, so Wes, you want to close that? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just ask you where right now um, are you working at? What is your, you know, main objective right now? I see a Go Blue pin there yeah. and uh, Michigan. And uh, tell us a little bit about where you're at right now, how people could uh, get influenced uh, by you, because obviously you have a very high knowledge of uh, certain subjects and being a part of the AO, I, I know it's second to none. So Dr. Wong, as we're closing out, uh, tell us a little bit about where we can find you and what you're currently doing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still, uh, uh, like I said, I'm a professor and director of graduate periodontics at the University of Michigan. We do a lot of research on the periimplantitis field, mm-hmm. and we are one of the leading uh, experts in this area. We have a, uh, I have a textbook uh, co-author published. It's called Unfolding Periimplantitis and trying to help people to understand periimplantitis more. And we are always open for people to come to visit us at University of Michigan and certainly attend the AO annual meetings. So we invite all the war experts to talk about this topic and to untangle these issues so people can learn from the basic through the biology and to which they understand how to treat and prevent this complex periimplantitis problem. Right. And the book is published uh, through? Uh, Quintessence. Quintessence, right? Who is who publishes 
Jomi, right. and IPG, or yep. IJPRD, yep. right? Yep. So thank you so much for being on the show today and really sharing your passion regarding peri-implantitis. We'll definitely be checking out your book and maybe highlight it on the show. Jeremy. Yeah, I look forward to hearing from you.